David, I usually begin my interviews by saying welcome to Waterstones, but if it's an author I've spoken to before, I will often say welcome back to Waterstones. But because you were the first ever guest on the Waterstones podcast many, many years ago, I feel like I should actually say welcome home to Waterstones. It does feel like home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a while ago, wasn't it? Yeah, 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 it was a while ago. Yeah, uh, yeah. But the good thing is we have a new book to talk about. Yes. You are here. I know that many readers of your books, for, for many of them, the thing that they love that they fall in love with is the characters. They become yeah. very, very involved in their lives. And so I thought probably best for us to start by you introducing your two characters in, in well, your two main characters in You Are Here. Should we go ladies first and start with Marnie? Yes, Marnie. I love writing Marnie. Marnie is a copy editor. She uh, is someone who's divorced, who lives by herself in Brixton, very much a Londoner, very much a city girl. Uh, a brilliant copy editor, but someone who has become, whose work has contributed to a slight reclusiveness. So she's a very smart, funny woman, but she's become rather introverted and doesn't leave the flat as much as she once did. Um, she's very comfortable in her life, but really feels like something needs to jolt her out of this inaction. And so she's bullied onto going on a walking trip the last thing she wants to do in the <laughs> Lake District by her friend Cleo, and that's where we first meet Marnie. So yes, Cl Cleo is the is the friend in common here who's yeah. who's meddling. Um, so yes, she gets Marnie involved in this walk, and and your other character, Michael. Tell us about him. Michael is a geography teacher. Uh, he lives in York. He's very passionate about the outdoors. Uh, very knowledgeable. Um, a very good teacher but going through something of a, of a trauma because of recent events, the, 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 what he hopes is a temporary separation from his wife. So he's going through quite a, a dark patch and his solution to this is to get away from home, get outside, walk and walk and walk. And his plan is to walk unaccompanied uh, the width of the country on the famous Wainwright Coast to Coast walk. And that's where we meet Michael. I'm going to step away from the characters for the moment and yeah. come straight for you because you are on record as being somebody who loves a walk and who loves a walk on their own. Yeah. Let's talk about walking first because I want you yeah. to explain to me what it is you love about it so much and why in particular you enjoy doing it on your own. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've always loved it and I have used to go a lot with my family when, when it was possible to persuade my kids to, that that was a good time. Uh, and uh, it, it's just, I have a kind of, you know, I, I'm terrible at all sports. I really am. I'm, I mean, anything with a ball, anyone throws a ball at me, I'm in a complete panic. But I do really, really love walking. I'm very happy to walk all day. For me, it's an opportunity to think, to listen to music, think about ideas, uh, relax, eat terrible food, all of those things. I really love it. I love maps. I love getting lost. I, I don't mind the rain. So it's something I really love, and it's harder and harder these days to get someone to go with me. So I, I, once a year I go by myself. I go for a four or five day walk, see how far I can get. Mm. Always train station to train station, uh, across the dales or around the lakes or, or, or the North York Moors, and it's a real highlight of my year. And I'd always wanted to write about it, write about you know the, the, both the, the wonderful things you can get from that experience and the misery of it as well. And uh, I thought perhaps it would be a family story and then came up with this idea that maybe you could do a love story in which each of the stages of the walk represent a stage in their relationship. So that's what this novel is. It's, it's a 10 day itinerary and something happens on each day to these two people to bring them possibly closer together. So that was the origins of the idea. But it was a chance really to write about something that I really love mm. and which I wish I could do more often, but work tends to keep me in London. Um, but as soon as I get a chance, that's what I like to do. And that coast to coast walk that you that features yeah. in the book, is that a walk that you have personally done? Because it's, yeah. it's a significant walk. I mean, it it's, is. <laughs> it's more than four or five days, isn't it? It's, <laughs> it's, it's usually, uh, if you're really fast, you can do it in eight days. Uh, I've done it, I did it in three sections. The first day is, is a beautiful walk across the lakes. Uh, the second day, the second section, uh, if you do, if you break it up, is Westmoreland and then the Dales, which is also very beautiful. And then the third section is, is quite a demanding long walk across the North Yorkshire Moors, mm. and uh, it's beautiful. It's, I mean, I think there are more beautiful walks, there are better walks, 
But just that sense, there's something very appealing with that idea that you've drawn a line across the country, mm. that you've seen you know, the, the Irish Sea and the North Sea. And um, it was lovely to, to have something to research. So certain sections I've walked many times. I've walked it in all weathers. Uh, I have a little notebook in my pocket, and if there's something that seems relevant to the novel, I've jotted it down. And so it's a novel that you could read with a map. You know, you could go mm. to, you could read it day by day and do the walk and and pin down the exact events where they happen on the map and in the real world. And um, that was a very appealing idea. It's been really fun to write this one. Partly because I love the subject matter, but but primarily because I really love Michael and Marnie, and it's a novel about conversation, about dialogue, and that's one of my favourite things to mm. write. It's lots of jokes, lots of stories that they tell each other, lots of truths and half truths that come out. Um, it's two people kind of dancing around each other, and that's been really enjoyable to write, and specifically to write in this environment. Would it be fair for me to say that bo both of those characters in their own way are actually quite lonely at the beginning yeah. of the book and that what they find is a connection with each other? Yeah, I mean, I, I often, especially, there's an element of romantic comedy to the book and in romantic comedy, loneliness is always the enemy and I didn't want it to be quite as cut and dried as that. You mm. know, in the novel, actually, there's a lot to be said for the way they're living their lives. Certainly Marnie, she's... She, she, was divorced very young and she, since then she's been by herself and she's found a way to make it productive and enjoyable and satisfying in its own way and at the same time they both need a kind of jolt mm. the kind of jolt that only can come from another person and uh, Michael is in a in, is in a bit of a, a crisis you know, he's there have been various recent events that have have been both a physical and, and mental challenge to him and so he's trying to find a way out of that and he thinks it's going to be in solitude and then suddenly he's no longer walking alone he's walking with Marnie and getting to know Marnie so there's a kind of road movie element you know that great tradition in road mm. movies about two people being thrown together on a journey that's very much uh, the feel of this novel and where a lot of the comedy comes from. Yeah, uh, It's about two people who both are pretty sure that they want to be by themselves and both possibly change their minds over the course of this encounter. As you say, it, it is a romantic comedy and your books are often viewed as romances, but I'm really intrigued by the difference, or rather the point at which friendship mm. becomes something else. Because yeah. I, reading the book, I was thinking, is this going to be a book really about two people becoming good friends? Or is it going to tip over into romance? Thing. And I was thinking about some of your other books, and I was like, well, that, that could really, is meant, in many ways, is about friendship first, and yeah. then finding something else. Tell me yeah. a bit about those two different things, and, and what, what does tip the balance? Well, I guess specifically with this is that they're, a, they're at a very particular time of their lives, mm. you know, where... The whole idea of dating, putting yourself out there, going to bars or out, using the apps, all of that stuff has started to seem impossible. Mm. Just uh, And so what's the alternative? Well, the alternative is to kind of find a way to live happily by yourself, which is what they're both hoping to do. And uh, it isn't a question of love at first sight. It's that romantic tradition of getting to know someone, wondering if this is potentially something else, with all the, the misapprehensions and the miscommunications and the crossed wires that that can involve. Mm. Um, and that's a very, I mean, the main reason not to have people fall in love immediately in a story is so that there's a story. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, if they're, if they're both single and they're attracted to each other and they can get together, then, you know, where, where are you? You, you? you certainly don't have 250 pages. So, uh, a lot of the, a lot of it is sounds. It sounds quite hard-hearted. A lot of it is mechanics, mm. you know, keeping them apart. What are the reasons these two people can't be together? Mm. But also, it's that feeling that maybe, maybe friendship is just as good. You know, mm -hmm. Maybe friendship is satisfying and and entertaining and nurturing for both of them. And maybe it doesn't need to be the other thing. Um, so the novel, as with some of my other novels, is toying with that idea. What's the difference? What's the difference between romantic love and intense friendship? There's a really lovely moment in the book where Marnie is talking about this decision to be child-free yeah. and that 
the problem with that is that it meant that she would always have to have a very heavy conversation with a prospective yeah. partner about it. Yeah. And yet, of course, in telling Michael this, she's having a very easy conversation with him. Yeah. As a friend, I suppose, at that yeah. point. And I thought that was really interesting that we, we find it very easy to talk to our friends about very difficult things. Yeah. And as you say, maybe sometimes close friendship is the most important thing to have first before it maybe develops into something else. Yeah, absolutely. There's nothing that they haven't said to each other. There's very little that they don't know about each other before the idea of romance mm. rears up. And, um, and I like the idea that, you know, that uh, one of the observations that people often make about walking is that there's something about it. There's something about the way your eyes are, generally speaking, looking forward. There's a kind of rhythm to it. There's always time to fill. That it's a, it's a, it's a brilliant way to have open and frank conversations. That, that, that some of the best conversations come out of those long days mm. where, where you can wander in and out of various subjects, perhaps open up a little more than you might do if you were sitting in a, you know, in a, in a opposite each other in a little restaurant, getting to know each other. Mm. So a lot of the things they discover about each other is in a, is in a, a, a casual, unselfconscious way that takes them both by surprise, I think. I think it's about, yeah, unexpected friendship. I mean, Michael really doesn't want to talk to anyone. He's determined <laughs> to be by himself yeah. and, and for various reasons isn't permitted to. And so for him, it's, it takes a little longer. You know, Marnie is very funny, a storyteller, very garrulous and, and witty. And Michael is a little bit more reserved. So it takes him a while before he can trust her and trust himself to be entirely frank. And even then, he isn't entirely frank but I like the idea that these difficult of difficult conversations coming out in a way that isn't uh, that that allows them proper seriousness but isn't uh, portentous or mm. or uh, over dramatic is, is is sort of um yeah it warm and understanding and uh, and and frank you know these subjects are terribly difficult and and at the same time, being frightened of them or being overly somber isn't necessarily the answer mm. either. So I'm trying to strike a balance between, again, I guess this is in all the books, writing about stuff that is tough and serious, but in a way that is um, sometimes you know, it's sensitive but still humorous. Mm. Well, you, you mentioned yeah. the humor. It's such a crucial yeah. part of the book. It's a very, very funny book. Yeah. And I will imagine many people especially writers, will be like, how, how does he do that? How do you keep writing very funny dialogue? Is it based on, I suppose, having these great characters and then just sort of seeing how they can play off each other? Or is it far more technical than that? Are you sitting there kind of going, right, gag, 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 and you need to find the, the humour? Um, there's a bit of, there is a technical aspect to it in that you can, on the page, introduce an element of performance. You know, you can work out where the pauses come and you can use punctuation in a very precise way and, and, and you can and where you place the stage directions. There is a way to kind of to stand it up even though you're only really writing. And mm. I do think quite a lot about that. Um, where are the big speeches and where does it become staccato? You you can look on the page, even physically on the page and see the rhythm of the speech. And that enables you to put to kind of direct the scene, I mm. guess, to put the laughs in the right place. So there's a technical aspect, but more usefully, it's about knowing who's talking and building the character in the same way that an actor would and knowing what their attitude is. Um, with Marnie, Marnie's very astute about language. You know, that's why she's a wonderful copy editor. Mm. She's very precise and clever about what people say and what they really mean and the sp specific observations about language. Um, Michael's humour tends to come from a kind of, a sort of, um, a bluntness, a, a kind of open, a, a, a kind of reserved um, frankness that, um, that is very touching and charming. You know, he's, he's not as acerbic as Marnie or as, as cynical, but is capable of a lovely kind of quiet wit too. Mm. Um, more, more, more self-contained, more reserved, but still witty. And so once you have a kind of energy for them and an attitude, 
uh, then it becomes like improvisation and it's really enjoyable. I don't do much rewriting of dialogue. I tend to kind of get into... Oh, that's pretentious. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, you, it, it's like improv in that you, you get into a flow, you know yeah. what the situation is, you know what they, what they both want, and then you can kind of play around with it. So that it then feels like the only thing they could say. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And there's a long, you know, long dialogue in a, in a sort of steamy window fish and chip shop where, where they're the coolest, youngest people there. <laughs> <laughs> and once you have that situation and once you know how they feel about that, i.e. Marnie really doesn't want to be there and is a bit cynical, and Michael actually feels very at home. Yeah. Once you have those two attitudes, then it's fun to have them banter and bounce off each other and, and chat. I could do it forever. What I have to do is stop myself and have something happen and move the story on. One of my favourite bits of the book is a kind of game they play, which is that they listen to their respective music collections yeah. on shuffle, so they yes. can't edit, it. just what, whatever comes up, comes up. And it shows once again that music is so clearly important to you in your yeah. writing. Tell me a bit about why it is such a useful tool in sort of giving them, I guess, a way to talk to each other, but also, I suppose, signifying certain things. Yeah, I mean, that's a game I play myself when I go for a long walk. I listen to a lot of music and um, often quite nostalgic music for some reason. Uh, and I like music as an expression of character. But I'm also aware that I, as a writer, I'm probably a bit too reliant on it. So the rule I have with this is that there would be no You Are Here mixtape. Because if there was, it would just be terrible. It would be really <laughs> <laughs> awful and embarrassing and not a reflection, not, not a reflection of their tastes, just a reflection of their history. Do you know what I mean? There's yeah. a difference between everything you have in your record collection and the things you love. And what they listen to is a random shuffle through you know, the darker corners of their record collection. So it isn't by any means their favorite songs or my favorite songs, but it's the idea of using music as a, as a cue, as a, a catalyst for a conversation about their past, former boyfriends, sex, uh, school memories, you know, it's a, it's a little, um, almost like a sort of game of free association. When, what do you think of when you hear this song? Mm. And again, I, I really loved writing that chapter. I could have put my own you know, music collection on shuffle and, and riffed on all of the songs that came up. Um, so it's them getting to know each other, but not, not in a kind of curated way, more in a kind of random open way. So the songs that come up, you know, aren't always the best songs. <laughs> But they're songs that they have something to, to say about. Yeah. And it's a fun little game. And it comes also at just the right time. It comes at a point where they, they are, the friendship is turning into something else. Um, music was obviously hugely important in the recent um, TV adaptation of, of One Day. Yeah. I mean, one of the many great things about that TV series. Um, I saw you talking about One Day um, when the sort of series was launched. And you looked so happy about the fact that you hadn't had to be the person who was doing the adapting. Yeah. Because <laughs> you, you, you've described adapting your own work as a bit like doing your own dentistry. Yeah. Um, it must be, you, as I say, you look so happy watching that programme come out and it, what has it been like to sort of see the reaction from people? Because it's become quite the sensation. People yeah. have loved it. I mean, obviously, it's been, you know, it's been delightful, especially because I genuinely love and admire everyone involved. Mm. I mean, it was an extremely happy collaborative process there was never any sense that you know this thing was being taken off you and contorted and everyone set out with the same aim which was to try and replicate the the feeling of reading the book both in terms of the rhythm of it and the tone of it and the actual specifics of the plot point mm. you know, that, 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 that actually um, we all had a single aim and because we also had time and to a certain degree money we were able to do it properly in lots of detail and there's very few there are a couple of uh, chapters in the book that we've that we've cut you know that in the novel there's a little bit more about how she becomes a writer mm. um, there's a little bit more about domestic life at a certain stage of their relationship and uh, you know that stuff is harder to put on screen but apart from that th there was very little that we cut and we had a really nice time 
and it was fun and nostalgic and great for me also to work with younger people um, who, you know, had their own input. That's the other thing. Again, you, you often have this um, impression of adaptation that it's going to be adversarial and that the actors are going to want to change things and that this is going to be a betrayal of the source material. And for me, it was... I was very, very happy to put that to one side mm -hmm. and to actually listen and take on board observations and personal input. And, and so working with a team of writers and those actors and four brilliant directors and great designers and a fantastic music coordinator, it was very, very, very happy. And um, at the same time, you know, a huge gamble because love stories are very difficult to put on screen. They don't always work. They don't have the same kind of narrative hooks that a thriller or a sci-fi show or an action series has. So it was definitely a risk and we had no expectations of it taking off. Mm. But the fact that it has has been, you know, great. And the fact that also it's, it's taking people back to the novel, which doesn't always happen. Um, that's good too. I think people liked those characters so much they wanted more of them. A bit more, yeah, absolutely. A bit more of them. Yeah. And um, that's been, you know, really exciting. Just to finish off uh, with you are here, as I said, I mentioned that, that the walk that features in the book is, is, is quite a serious one. Yeah. I actually have a friend who is about to go on that very walk. Oh, really? So okay. do you have any advice that you would like oh. to offer as somebody who's done it themselves? It's very hard because I don't want to be... There's one stretch which is really boring. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's so boring. The stretch that's the bit just, just, oh, I'm scared. I don't want to sort of criticize anyone's landscape. But there's a long stretch between uh, Richmond and then before you get it on properly onto the North Yorkshire Moors, mm. North York Moors, uh, that's just arable and boring and dull. And I think it's fine to get a bus. <laughs> Don't tell anyone. Just order the taxi. Get them to drop you off. No one need know. It's a, not a nice walk. And also, uh, you know, the weather, you will definitely get rained on. I got r r wetter than I've ever been in my life. Yep. Uh, at, at actually the worst stage of the walk, which is the, the, not the worst, the hardest stage of the walk, which is the second day, where you have to climb over into this other valley, and it's absolutely brutal. And I did that in torrential rain with my rucksack, and it was definitely physically the hardest thing I've ever done. Yeah. So even though it isn't, you know, it isn't a Himalayan walk, it's 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 accessible. It definitely has its makes its own demands, and that so be prepared for that as well. I'm imagining a, a bus company in Richmond putting <laughs> your quote on their bus like it's fine Just to take skip a bus. It. <laughs> Just skip it. It's fine. I'm just trying to think if I'm being unfair about it. No, I'm not. No, it's really boring. <laughs> <laughs> David, as of a, a complete pleasure to speak to you uh, about your work in general, but particularly Thanks you are me. here, a really enjoyable reach. Oh, great. Thank you very much.